Keberangkatan Duli Yang Maha Mulia Paduka Sri Sultan Perak Darul Rizwan dan Duli Yang Maha Mulia Raja Pemasuri Perak Darul Rizwan. Ladies and gentlemen, announcing the arrival of His Royal Highness Sultan Nazrin Shah, Sultan of Perak and Her Royal Highness Tuanku Zara Raja Pemasuri Perak Accompanied by the Right Honourable Lord Carnworth and Lady Carnworth and the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Malaya. Ampun Tuanku, Patik Mohon Perkenan, Duli Yang Maha Mulia Tuanku untuk Patik meneruskan acara majlis ini dalam bahasa Inggeris. Your Royal Highness Sultan Nazrin Shah, the Sultan of Perak. Your Royal Highness Tuanku Zara, Raja Pemaisuri Perak. Your Highnesses, the Right Honourable Lord Carnworth and Lady Carnworth. The Trustees of the Sultan Azlan Shah Foundation and the University of Malaya I have been given both the privilege and the honor to welcome each and every one of you this evening. For the past 27 years, eminent jurists from all over the common law world have come to Malaysia and delivered the Sultan Azlan Shah Law Lectures in honor of His Royal Highness, Sultan Azlan Shah. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening marks the 28th lecture in this prestigious series. Ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed with the lecture, we now take a moment to reflect on His Royal Highness, Sultan Azlan Shah, in whose honor these lectures are named. We remember a great and illustrious man, the only one ever to hold three constitutional offices in the country, head of the nation's judiciary as Lord President, the Sultan of Pera, and as the ninth Yang Datuan Agung of Malaysia. His Royal Highness, indeed, has left an indelible mark. Pray silence as we remember His Royal Highness, Sultan Azlan Shah.
Ladies and gentlemen, His Royal Highness, Sultan Aslan Shah will always be remembered. As a tribute to his father, His Royal Highness, Sultan Nazrin Shah, has commissioned a special publication entitled His Royal Highness, Sultan Aslan Shah, a tribute, and has dedicated the publication to the loving memory of his father. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lectures is a testament to His Royal Highness's contribution to the law and of the highest respect and regard in which His Royal Highness was held by the international legal community. This evening, we are again most privileged to have another outstanding jurist to deliver the 28th Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture. To introduce this evening's speaker, I now invite the Dean of the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya, Dean. Ampun Tuanku. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege and honor to have the Right Honorable Lord Robert Carnworth of Notting Hill, one of the 12 Justices of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, here with us this evening. The Right Honorable Lord Carnworth will deliver the 28th Sultan Azan Shah Law Lecture entitled Environmental Law in a Global Society. Lord Carnworth is a passionate advocate of environmental law, an increasingly important body of laws which recognizes that the quality of the natural environment is a legitimate concern to every citizen. The need to achieve a proper balance between the right to development and the importance of environmental protection to meet the needs of present and future generations is a pressing legal and social issue which is now being addressed on a global scale. There is growing appreciation that in order to achieve sustainable development, environmental protection must constitute an integral part of the development process and cannot be considered in isolation from it. In this regard, Lord Conworth is a member of the United Nations International Advisory Council for the Advancement of Justice, Governance and Law for Environmental Sustainability, of which our current Chief Justice of Malaysia, Tun Arif and Zakara, is also a member. As a judge, Lord Carnworth has made significant contributions to the development of environmental and planning law. He has developed important judgments in recent decisions of the UK Supreme Court concerning environmental law, involving issues such as the UK government's promotion of the HS2 high-speed rail link from London to the north of England, the Scottish government's proposal to construct the fast link carriageway, or as we call it highways, road scheme, waste disposal under environmental license and waste management permit, and the right to carry out activities in the public interest under the grant of planning permission, namely speedway and motocross racing activities. Lord Carnworth read law at Trinity College, Cambridge University. He was called to the English bar by the Honorable Society of the Middle Temple, and in 2012, Lord Carnworth was appointed as a Justice of the United Kingdom Supreme Court. Ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure to invite Lord Carnworth of Notting Hill to deliver the 28th Sultan Aslan Shah Law Lecture. Lord Carnworth. Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, my Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is an extraordinary honor for me to be invited by the Sultan Aslan Shah Foundation and the University of Malaya to contribute to this prestigious series of lectures. 
And as you all know, and as we've heard, this is a particularly special occasion, an occasion for both sadness and celebration. Sadness because it is the first such lecture since the much-mourned death of the Sultan in April this year, but at the same time an opportunity for celebration of his great achievements in so many fields. Since I was not fortunate to know him personally, I thought it appropriate to seek the assistance of someone who has known the Sultan and his family for many years and who has been a strong supporter of these lectures, that is Lord Wolfe, our former Chief Justice. I bring this message from him. He says, I am very disappointed that I am unable to attend this year's Aslan Shah lecture. The primary reason for my disappointment is that by my presence, I could have demonstrated my immense admiration for His Highness, the late Sultan, and my sadness at his death. He had great many qualities on which I am not qualified to comment. However, in relation to his role as a jurist, as in common with him, I am a former Chief Justice, I can say with confidence that he was among the finest judicial figures of his time. This is confirmed by his wisdom in establishing the series of lectures that bears his name. The legal world is indeed fortunate that His Royal Highness Sultan Nazrim Shah shares his father's recognition of the importance of the rule of law and is continuing his father's tradition of hosting these lectures. That was Lord Wolfe's message, and I respectfully echo those thoughts. And on behalf of myself and my wife Bambina, I add our sincere thanks to Sultan Nazrim Shah and Her Royal Highness for the exceptionally warm and generous welcome that they have given to us since our arrival here a few days ago. Now, my subject, as you've heard, is environmental law in a global society. And as I look around this vast room, I see at the back more, I think, the younger people in this audience, if I can say that, who are the ones who perhaps this is of most direct importance to, because, of course, it is you who will be faced with the challenges which the world is now beginning to understand. Now, the subject of environmental law is new to this series of lectures. Uh, this is not, I know, because of any lack of interest on behalf of the late Sultan. In a lecture to university students in 1997, he spoke of the great challenges facing this country in the next millennium the need to tackle environmental degradation and achieve sustainable development. He also spoke of the role of the law. I put up there those words which are very much at the heart of what I'm going to be talking about. Legal principles and rules help convert our knowledge of what needs to be done into binding rules that govern human behavior. Law is the bridge between scientific knowledge and political action. The bridge between scientific knowledge and political action. Now, this evening I shall be looking at the historic development of laws to meet these challenges across the world, and particularly the part that courts and judges have played and must continue to play if those laws are to be given practical effect. Of the daunting challenges facing this country in particular, I am not qualified to speak in any detail. Malaysia, it seems, is ranked among the dozen most important countries in the world for biological richness, but also among the dozen most important countries for, for illegal wildlife smuggling. According to some commentaries, you have excellent laws for the protection of the environment, but more problems in enforcing those laws. And you have problems of division of responsibility between state and federal powers. But on the other side, I learnt from a recent lecture of your Chief Justice, who I'm delighted to see here today, that in 2011 he announced a new policy commitment on behalf of the Malaysian judges towards the preservation of the environment. This was followed in September 2012 by a practice direction establishing a new specialised court to improve the handling of environmental criminal cases. I also take this opportunity to pay tribute to the important leadership role he has played in this field, not only at home, but also regionally and internationally. And I've been fortunate to be a fellow member with him of the International Advisory Council on Environmental Justice, 
of which you have heard. In Malaysia, I hear, he's not been willing to allow the judges to sit back in their courtrooms. Environmental awareness has to be learned. Here is what he said about some of their outreach programs. In one program, judges were brought for a night walk in the 130 million years old jungle to venture through rapid rivers and walk on a 40 meters high canopy walkway in the Bahang National Park. A special session with the Aborigines was arranged for the judges to orientate themselves to the original inhabitants of the forest. That was impressive stuff to me. I'm sorry that we cannot offer our judges in my country anything quite like that. One reason why environmental law has not previously fe featured in these lectures may be that it is a relatively new arrival on the legal scene. It was not a record, recognized subject in the days long past when I was studying at university. The growth of modern environmental law dates from the late 1960s and the early 1970s. Some have linked its emergence as a subject of global concern with the beginnings of space travel and the first photographs of our world from outside taken by the Apollo astronauts. Now, um, I, I emphasize at once that this is not going to be a picture show. I've been allowed two pictures, one at the beginning and one at the end. But that, I think, is such an important image. And for those of you who are a lot younger than me, it's difficult to uh, have a, a conception of what it meant when we first saw, back in the early 1970s, pictures of our own world from outside. And here's what the... Brundtland Commission, that was a commission set up by the United Nations to advise on environmental issues, which reported in 1987. This is what they said. In the middle of the 20th century, we saw our planet from space for the first time. Historians may eventually find that this vision had a greater impact on thought than did the Copernican Revolution of the 16th century, which upset the human self-image by revealing that the Earth is not the center of the universe. From space, we see a small and fragile ball, dominated not by human activity and edifice, but by a pattern of clouds, oceans, greenery, and soils. Humanity's inability to fit its activities into that pattern is changing planetary systems fundamentally. Many such changes are accompanied by life-threatening hazards. This new reality, from which there is no escape, must be recognized and managed. Now, since those early days, we have seen the rapid development of a new and complex system of laws giving effect to principles which are now shared by countries and regions across the world and shared between common law and civil law system. This global environmental law, as it has been called, blurs the traditional distinctions. It's a field of law that is international, national, and transnational in character all at once. Now, of course, the seeds of environmental law, though not under that name, can be traced back much further. For the common law world, a good starting point might be the 19th century in the middle, in the 1850s in the United Kingdom, when the courts and parliament were struggling with the challenges brought about by the Industrial Revolution and the growth of urban populations. There was a famous case in 1858 relating to Birmingham Corporation which was having problems coping with the needs of its growing population, in particular, the need for sewers to have effluent. In, in 1858, the court granted an injunction to stop the corporation pouring untreated effluent from its sewers into the River Tame. The court was unimpressed by the problems that the corporation was facing in coping with these problems. They were described by the judge, quotes, as a matter of almost complete indifference. His function, he thought, was not to take over the public administration of Birmingham, but to apply the law. But in fact, things were not quite as drastic as those words suggest. Raw sewage was not left to flow through the streets of Birmingham. The strong line taken by the courts was in practice mitigated by suspension of the injunctions. This gave the polluters under supervision of the court both the incentive and the time needed to come up with effective technical solutions to their problems. Many important developments in the technology of pollution control flowed from that judicial process. 
As we shall see, there are close parallels between that process developed by the judges in the 19th century and the continuing mandamus, as it's called, developed by the Indian Supreme Court and other jurisdictions in more recent years. Moving forward nearly a century and looking to the global picture, the famous American trail smelter case in 1941 has been described as a crystallizing moment for international environmental law. It related to a complaint by the, American, by the residents of the state of Washington of sulfur dioxide emissions from a smelter in Trail, British Columbia. The arbitral tribunal enunciated the now well-established principle that no state has a right to permit the use of its territory in such a manner as to cause injury by fumes to the territory of another. The involvement of the United Nations itself came much later. The United Nations Charter of 1945 made no mention of the environment. But the first major initiatives at United Nations level were the Stockholm Conference on the Human Environment in 1972, and in the same year, the establishment of the United Nations Environment Program. The 1972 Stockholm Declaration provided a set of general principles which, though not legally binding as such, have provided a framework for the later development of environmental law nationally and internationally. It was based on the shared responsibility of all to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. We had to wait for the Rio Declaration in 1992 for more flesh to be put on the bones of the Stockholm Declaration. Many of the principles set out in the Rio Declaration are now widely established in law and court practice. Sustainable development, intergenerational equity, the precautionary principle, polluter pays, and so on. Of central importance was principle seven. It required all states to cooperate in a global partnership to conserve and restore the Earth's ecosystem. But their responsibilities were to be common but differentiated in recognition of their differing contributions to global environmental degradation and the different technologies and resources available to them. The spirit of Principle 7 had already been seen in action in relation to the protection of the ozone layer. It's worth dwelling on this episode. It's a prime example of science, law, and political action in harmony. It is also a success story which may offer lessons for the future. In the early 1970s, scientists had warned that chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, then used in a wide variety of refrigerants and other industrial processes, had the potential to destroy the stratospheric ozone layer that protects the Earth from harmful ultraviolet radiation. In the following decade, scientists were able to document the build-up and long lifetime of CFCs in the atmosphere and find proof of their effects. The public and policy makers were motivated to take action. This led to the 1985 Vienna Convention on the Protection of the Ozone Layer, followed by the 1987 Montreal Protocol on Ozone Depleting Substances. Critical to success was the respect paid to the principle of differentiated interests and needs of developing countries, particularly to ensure access to resources and alternative technologies. As a result, in less than 30 years since the protocol, the vast majority of ozone-depleting chemicals have been phased out worldwide, and the stratospheric ozone layer appears to be on its way to recovery. Now, returning to the Rio Declaration itself, uh, I want to mention two other specific principles which have become very prominent. The first was Principle 17, Environmental Impact Assessment. That requires a detailed expert assessment available to the public or the impact of projects likely to have a significant adverse effect on the environment. That has been a strong weapon in practice. Lack of an appropriate assessment was fatal to developments as diverse as a hydroelectric project in Sarawak, phosphate mining in Sri Lanka, the diversion of the river Akaloos in Greece, and the redevelopment of the Fulham football ground in London. In China in 2005, there were even reports of an environmental assessment storm when the State Environmental Protection Administration 
issued orders to halt 30 large construction projects because of failures to comply with assessment requirements. No less important is principle 10, the right to public participation. That has three pillars. First, the right of the public to relevant information held by public authorities. Secondly, the right to participate in the decision-making process. And thirdly, the right to effective access to judicial and administrative proceedings to enforce those rights. This simple tripartite formula has proved pervasive and highly effective. It has been given more elaborate and binding form in Europe in the Aarhus Convention. This convention was described by a former United Nations Secretary General as the most ambitious venture in the area of environmental democracy so far undertaken under the auspices of the United Nations. An important aspect of Principle 10 is the widening of access to the courts to enforce environmental protection. The traditional view was that judicial review was confined to those with a specific legal interest in the subject matter of the case, distinct from that of the public at large. In many parts of the common law world, including, I believe, now Malaysia, that has given way, in my view rightly, to a much broader approach. As my colleague Lord Hope said in a recent case, environmental law proceeds on the basis that the quality of the natural environment is of legitimate concern to everyone. Some courts have taken the logic of that proposition a stage further. Thus, the Philippine Supreme Court, in the famous Opposa case, memorably upheld a challenge to the state's policies for granting consents to fell in the country's virgin forests in an action brought by some 43 children from all over the Philippines on, a par on behalf of themselves and of, quotes, generations yet unborn. Now I turn to the development of environmental law in the constitutions of different countries. Because uh, we have seen during this period how environmental principles have found their way into constitutional law, first by stealth almost, and then explicitly. Earlier constitutions, such as your own Malaysian constitution of 1957, made no express reference to the environment. But in spite of that, from about 1990, some courts, uh, led by India and Pakistan, began to interpret general guarantees of the right to life as including not just the right to, quotes, mere existence from conception to death, but also the right to a healthy environment in which to live. And I was interested to see that that lead has been followed more recently here in Malaysia, in the Bato Badji case in 2001, your own federal court held that life in Article 5.1 of the Constitution, quotes, incorporates all those facets that are an integral part of life itself and those matters which go to form the quality of life. Now, by contrast with those earlier constitutions, nearly all those adopted since the early 1990s have explicitly recognized in some form the right to a clean and healthy environment. And a recent study showed that there were some 130 states which now have such provisions in their constitutions. They take many forms. I'll quote one which I liked in particular, which is Bolivia's 2010 Mother Earth Law, Ley de Derechos de la Madre Tierra. And Mother Earth is defined as the dynamic living system formed by the indivisible community of all life systems and living beings who are interrelated, interdependent, and complementary, which share a common destiny. That's almost poetic, but it's brought down to earth slightly for the purpose of enforcing her legal rights. Mother Earth has, quotes, the character of a collective subject of public interest, which I believe is necessary to give her standing in the Bolivian courts. Now, we can see the same trend from the implicit to the explicit in other systems of law. It was only in 1986 that the European Community Treaty was amended to include express provisions on environmental protection. But before then, a substantial body of law had been built up by the Commission with the support of the European Court of Justice, based on the legal premise that harmonization of natural environmental laws was needed to remove non-tariff barriers to trade. So also in human rights law, 
the European Convention on Human Rights, dating from the immediate post-war period, said nothing in terms about the environment. But in a series of cases starting in the mid-1990s, the European Court of Human Rights held that Article 8, which protects the right to private life and the home, extended also to the protection of the home environment. The court has conceded a wide margin of appreciation to national governments on matters of policy, but has been willing to intervene strongly where national authorities have failed to enforce their own regulatory laws. By contrast, the much more recent African Charter on Human and People's Rights of 1981 provides expressly in Article 24 that, quotes, all peoples shall have the right to a general satisfactory environment favorable to their development. And that has been held to impose obligations on governments to tackle environmental degradation and promote secure, ecologically sustainable development and use of natural resources. While I'm on Article 8 of the European Convention, I hope I may be given a, a slight diversion to say a word about the lecture in this series given last year by my colleague, Lord Sumption. He was somewhat critical of some of the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, and particularly of its, what he called its expansive approach to interpretation of Article 8, which he thought it was using to reflect its own view of what rights are required in a modern dem democracy. He didn't speak in terms of the protection of the home environment, and I think rightly so, because it's no big step to extend the protection of the home as such to protection from noise or pollution, which makes normal life impossible. But I feel with respect that his more general criticisms go too far. The European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg is not perfect any more than any other court, nor are all its decisions beyond criticism. That said, the convention with the court which administers it is one of the more remarkable achievements of our post-war world. It has developed into a single system of law supervised by a single international court, voluntarily adopted by 47 independent states. Most of them, only 70 years ago, were tearing each other apart in war, or 35 years ago were still divided by the Iron Curtain of Communism. Nor do I think the framers of the convention expected its interpretation to be stuck in the mindset of the immediate post-war era, any more than we look at Magna Carta through the eyes of the 13th century barons. I echo the words of the late Sultan. He said, whilst it is true that judges cannot change the letter of the law, they can instill into it the new spirit that a new society demands. I turn then to the role of the judges. In 1991, Lord Wolfe, uh, in an address to the UK Environmental Law Association, entitled his address, quotes, are the judiciary environmentally myopic? And I think his title suggested his own answer at that time. But I think we've come a long way since then. At global level, the International Court of Justice has itself moved forward. In 1996, for the first time, it acknowledged the protection of the environment as part of international law. It spoke of the environment as, quotes, not an abstraction, but the living space, the quality of life, and the very health of human beings, including generations unborn. A, layer, a year later, in the Hungarian Dams case, uh, it, for the first time, gave its express endorsement to the principle of sustainable development as part of international law. The potential of its role in environmental issues was seen earlier this year in its judgment concerning whaling in the Antarctic. The court held that the scale of Japan's whaling program could not reasonably be justified within the exception allowed by the Treaty for Scientific Research. It has been seen as a landmark case in the court's willingness to examine the scientific issues for itself and for that purpose to hear expert evidence subject for the first time to cross-examination. The central role of the judiciary also received worldwide recognition in 2002 at the Global Judges Symposium in Johannesburg. That brought together senior judges from around 60 countries from around the world at the invitation of UNEP. The Johannesburg 
principles adopted by the conference affirm the vital role of an independent judiciary and call for a UNEP-led program of judicial training and exchange of information on environmental law. I was privileged to represent the UK judiciary on the judicial task force which was set up by UNEP in, based in Nairobi which oversaw the development of that program. One of our early initiatives was the preparation of a judicial handbook on environmental law which attempted to draw together threads of environmental law from different countries and different systems around the world. And I think that is still available on the UNEP website, though much in need of updating. An important part of the UNEP program was to develop judicial cooperation on a regional basis. The European Union Forum of Judges for the Environment, of which I was a founder member, will celebrate its 10th anniversary in Budapest later this month. More recently, in this part of the world, the Asian Judges Network on the Environment was formally launched in Manila in 2013. It provides a means for experience sharing among senior judges of the South Asia and Southeast Asia. In August this year, I attended a conference of South Asian senior judges in Colombo, hosted by the Chief Justice of Sri Lanka. The judges came from jurisdictions as diverse socially, legally, and geographically as Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and the Maldive Islands. But I was struck by the sense of shared purpose and values and willing to lear willingness to learn from the experiences of others. Now, one of Lord Wolfe's suggested remedies for judicial myopia in his 1991 lecture was the development of specialist environmental tribunals with wide powers to oversee and enforce laws for the protection of the environment. He was aware of only two examples of specialist tribunals at that time. But since then, the picture has been transformed dramatically. A study in 2011 identified more than 300 specialist environmental jurisdictions in 42 different countries, about half created in the previous five years. The growth has continued. I've already spoken of the Malaysian Environmental Court. In Colombo, we heard reports of other new recent developments, notably the Green Tribunals in India. In China, the first environmental tribunal was established in 2007, since when more than 130 environmental tribunals have been set up in 16 provincial divisions. In June this year, it was announced that the Supreme People's Court of China had set up its own Environment and Resources Tribunal to hear cases itself and to guide the work of lower specialist courts and tribunals. Crucial to the success of such tribunals are expertise, accessibility, and flexible procedures and remedies. Uh, there are many examples in the study, but I've chosen one which I particularly liked from the 2011 study. It relates to the Amazon region in Brazil, where an environmental judge seems to have earned the reputation of a modern-day Mikado in his determination to make the punishment fit the crime. His community service orders are directly related to environmental improvement or environmental education. Thus, we are told in one case, a convicted game poacher of protected Amazonian manatees has been turned into one of the country's leading wildlife advocates. The judge gave him the choice of a prison sentence or a year volunteering at a manatee rehabilitation center. He chose the latter and emerged a changed person. So they're the sort of examples. I don't say that they would work everywhere. Now, it should not be thought that the traditional courts have held back. As I have suggested, one has to go back to the 19th century in the UK to find anything comparable to the continuing mandamus procedures developed by some courts in the last 25 years. Best known are the cases in the Indian Supreme Court, many initiated by that great environmental advocate M.C. Mehta. They have made orders, for example, to oversee the cleaning up of industrial pollution threatening the Taj Mahal, to reduce air pollution in Delhi by conversion of all buses from diesel fuel to compressed natural gas. So also in the Philippines in 2008, the Supreme Court issued a continuing mandamus uh, to require the cleaning up of Manila Bay. And three years on, the Chief Justice and other justices were reported as taking a tour of the bay to inspect progress for themselves. I'm going to take, though, two other recent cases which 
perhaps deserve to be better known. The first is from Lahore in 2006. As in the Delhi case, it concerned air pollution by traffic. The High Court, relying on the right to life guaranteed by the Constitution, first established a Clean Air Commission to advise it, and then, based on its recommendations, laid down a detailed program to convert two-stroke um, rickshaws and motorcycles to four-stroke engines and convert buses from diesel to CNG and to make financial provision to ensure that, the, um, the, that they, were, they were not out of pocket. Now, this action had been initiated by a progressive environmental lawyer, Syed Mansour Ali Shah, who has since become a respected High Court judge. He was at the Colombo conference, and I asked for his own take on the case, and this is what he said in an email to me. We had filed this petition long ago, perhaps in 1997. Environment was not really on the judicial agenda at the time, and there were no green benches. The judges at that time didn't think much of the case, and it kept pending. As environmental awareness grew over the years, the case luckily came up before a more sympathetic justice. He was the first one to ask me if there was a solution to the problem before the court and wanted me to list the solutions. Um, difficult moment for a, a young advocate. But anyway, having been, he says, having been part of the Better Air Quality Network organized by the Asian Development Bank, I wrote to them for help. ADB suggested that they hold an international conference in Lahore and invite all the stakeholders. ADB flew in international experts. The two-day conference concluded with detailed recommendations on how to restore better air quality in Lahore. Those recommendations were placed before the court by us as if the international conference was the amicus curiae appointed by the court. The recommendations were put on the judicial record and objections were invited from the public. As no material objections were filed, the court directed the government to implement the recommendations. And he adds, the judge was awarded Best Green Judgment Award in Indonesia. So there's a very happy story, and it seems to be a splendid example of the potential for a committed and resourceful advocate using his imagination and all available resources, and indeed has lessons for any aspiring environmental lawyers among you at the back. The other case is from Argentina. It shows the power of the court to cut through bureaucratic divisions between different public and private agencies and impose a coherent solution. It concerned the heavily polluted Riatruela River in Buenos Aires. Now, lovers of Latin American music will recall that the mist over the Riatruela had been immortalized by a 1937 tango of that name, La Niebla del Riatruela. But it seems that the mist wasn't so romantic as seemed. It was largely due to industrial pollution. And more accurately, the tango writer had spoken of the river as a grim cemetery of ships, Torvo Cementerio de Naves. Now, the 1994 constitution had guaranteed the right to a healthy and balanced environment fit for human development. In 2008, in a case brought by a group of local residents, the Supreme Court, under Chief Justice Lawrence Zetti, decided to give effect to that right. It ordered the various government agencies, federal and local, to develop a coordinated plan under court supervision to clean up the river and the surroundings. To assist this task, the court involved a variety of different agencies, including the ombudsman, the NGOs, and the National Audit Office. In practical terms, it led to the approval in 2011 of an integral, integrated environmental cleanup plan with a 15-year $1.8 billion program for improving the river, the local industries, and the conditions of the residents of the 13 slums along its banks. The court also accepted the need for continuing supervision with annual public meetings in the court for officials to report on progress. According to the environmental journal Tierra America two months ago, work is now well underway, supported by an $840 million fund from the World Bank, the wide towpaths along the river have been reopened and paved to provide access and control over the river. Nearly 500 local industries have been converted to stop pollution, and another 1,300, including the biggest polluters, are in the process of conversion. 1.5 million people have been linked to the water supply network. Health assessments are being carried out in high-risk areas, 
and 14 health centres are under construction. A start has been made on the grim cemetery of ships with the removal from the river of some 60 sunken hulks and it seems that the mist over the rear trailer is at last beginning to dissipate. Now, these, of course, are national courts dealing with national problems. But what of the wider global picture? And that brings me finally to what is possibly the most difficult and urgent challenge of all for the global society, that of climate change. I have spoken of the success of the international efforts to save the ozone layer. Unfortunately, our efforts in relation to greenhouse gases have not fared so well. They started well with the 1992 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, followed by the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. The highly authoritative Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has taken an important role in achieving widespread scientific consensus and advancing public awareness. But the 2009 Copenhagen Conference failed to build on those foundations in the way many had hoped. The recent New York Summit on Climate Change has focused the attention of the world leaders once again, and the, sif, the scene now shifts to the negotiations in Paris next year. Now, in both of our own two countries, we have a good story to tell. Your Prime Minister was able to announce at the New York Summit that Malaysia was on track to meet its Copenhagen target of reducing greenhouse emissions by 40% by 2020 without financial assistance. And he said that Malaysia was, work, was ready to work with other fast-developing nations to argue for greater ambition in 2015 and to show that economic development and climate change are not competing goals. In the UK, our Climate Change Act of 2008 was a world leader in putting its commitments into binding legal form. Section 1 is clear and simple. It says that it is the duty of the Secretary of State to ensure that the net UK carbon account for the year 2050 is at least 80% lower than the 1990 baseline. And the Act has a whole range of machinery to make sure that, that commitment is given effect. That legal structure has already laid the basis for court action in a case in 2010 about a proposed third runway at Heathrow Airport the court required the government to review its plans to comply with its commitments under the Act. But we are small players in the international scene. One of the most important players, no doubt, is the United States, both, both in its global influence and economic power, and until recently overtaken by China in its levels of greenhouse emissions. There we can look to the Supreme Court's remarkable judgment in 2007 in Environmental Protection Agency against Massachusetts. It was given at a time when the political mood was deeply skeptical, but it has since provided a basis for stronger action by a more sympathetic administration. It may well prove to be in a pivotal moment in the battle for effective legal action on climate change, not only in the USA. In simple terms, the court by a five to four majority told the agency to get off the fence and start doing something about global warming. On one view, it was a narrow decision on the meaning of the word pollutant in the Environmental Protection Agency's statute, specifically in relation to traffic emissions, on the EPA's statutory duties in respect to so-called endangerment findings, and on the standing of the state of Massachusetts to bring the action. But its significance, to my mind, goes much further. The language of the majority judgment given by Justice Stevens was uncompromising. He recorded without dissent the claimant's assertion that global warming was the most pressing environmental challenge of our time. He charted the development over 40 years of a strong international consensus that global warming threatens severe and irreversible damage to the natural ecosystem. He swept aside EPA's arguments that emissions from American traffic made a relatively insignificant contribution to the global problem, or that developing countries such as China and India were posed to increase greenhouse gas emissions substantially. I quote, he said, agencies like legislatures do not generally resolve massive problems in one fell regulatory swoop. They instead whittle away at them over time, refining their preferred approach as circumstances change and as they develop a more nuanced understanding of how best to proceed. A reduction in domestic emissions 
would slow the pace of global emissions increases, no matter what happens elsewhere. Now, arguably, there's been some pulling back by the court in more recent cases. But the judgment has stood, and it has provided the legal base for the new administration to press ahead with an interventionist approach without the need for further legislative backing. Paved the way for a radical change in the approach of the agency, in December 2009, it issued an unequivocal endangerment finding highlighting the severe risks of climate change as a base, basis for a stronger regulatory action. Earlier this summer, the Obama administration launched new EPA rules to limit emissions of carbon gases from power plants by 30% by 2030. This initiative was described by Al Gore as the most important step taken by this country to combat the climate crisis. In the words to me of an American judicial colleague, the judgment helped create a political dynamic in which the executive branch could purport not to be going it alone, but rather acting in fulfillment of a judicial branch pronouncement. The judgment is also providing a precedent for legal action against governments in other countries. For example, in November 2013, the Dutch Agenda Foundation and some 9,900 individual citizens served a summons on the, state, on the Dutch state in an action to hold the state liable for failure to meet its climate change targets. Now, I hope this brief survey has helped to show how far environmental law has come in a few decades, nationally and internationally. I've also tried to show how the courts are making an important and practical contribution to that process. Of course, the courts can do very little on their own. They require committed individuals or organizations or states to bring the cases. They need access to technical expertise to point the way to practical solutions. And they need to engage all parties and agencies, public or private, with the powers and the resources to put those solutions into practice. But given those tools, the courts are uniquely placed to create the stable and legally enforceable structures necessary to ensure proper planning and supervision and enforcement. The courts cannot dictate policy, that is for government. But the courts can ensure that the policy is rational and coherent and consistent with the scientific evidence and that firm policy commitments are honored. And in our global society, judges across the world can learn from each other. So what lies ahead? Some of you may have read Clive Ponting's remarkable but frightening book, A New Green History of the World, the environment and the collapse of great civilizations. There is not much in the book to lift the gloom. Ponting shows how many of the great civilizations over the past 5,000 years have been destroyed by over-exploitation of their environment and how we risk suffering the same fate. They range from the Sumerians 3,000 years before the Christian era to the Mayas in South America in the early centuries of our own era and more recently, the ill-fated inhabitants of Easter Island. Now, that's my last picture. Those massive monuments still gaze into the future. And in a way, they seem to symbolize the uncertainties of our own age, but they conceal destructive power because it is now thought that to provide rollers and scaffolds necessary to move and erect them the island has destroyed most of the trees which were essential to the island's ecology. Clive Ponting sees lessons for us today. Like Easter Island, he says, the earth has only limited resources to support society. Like the islanders, the human population of the earth has no practical means of escape. Now, in the same period of 5,000 years, on one view, humanity has been astonishingly successful. World population has grown from a mere 15 million in 3000 BC to over 7 billion today, the vast majority in the last two centuries. But at the same time, we have built up for ourselves and our fellow creatures environmental problems of an unprecedented scale and complexity. One cause for hope is that unlike those other civilizations, we have the understanding or the means of understanding what is happening and what we could do about it. On the science, there's a remarkable degree of consensus. The problem is to translate that understanding into political action. Here above all, we may find ourselves looking to the law to provide a bridge 
and to the judges to offer at least some of the building blocks. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Malaya will now say a word of thanks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Ampun tuanku. Dengan penuh takzim, Patik memohon menghadap Tuli Yang Maha Mulia Paduka Seri Sultan Nazrin Shah Sultan Perak Darul Rizwan. Tuli Yang Maha Mulia Raja Pemasuri Perak Darul Rizwan Tuanku Sarah Salim Ampun Tuanku Beribu Ampun Sembah Patik Pohon Di Ampun Ampun Tuanku Patik Bersyukur Kehadrat Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Kerana Dengan Limpah Kurnianya Duli-duli Tuanku Selamat Secatera Dan Berkenan Percuma Duli Berangkat Mahadir Majlis yang ternama ini Iaitu The Sultan Azlan Shah Law Lecture Series Seri Kuliah Undang-Undang Sultan Azlan Shah Ini sememangnya Telah mempengaruhi Pembentukan dan perkembangan Undang-undang di tanah air Di tanah air Dan juga menjadi Satu-satunya Acara terulung yang ditunggu-tunggu Oleh semua yang terlibat dalam profesion undang-undang. Menjunjung kasih tuanku, seterusnya patik pohon perkenan tuanku untuk menyampaikan sepada dua kata penghargaan kepada para hadirin sekalian dalam bahasa Inggeris. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the right honourable Lord Conworth Notting Hill for such an enlightening lecture. We are grateful to him for sharing with us his thoughts and what should concern us today in the development of the law. Thank you, sir, once again. On behalf On behalf of the uh, University of Malaya, I would like to thank all our distinguished guests and those present for taking the time to attend this prestigious lecture. Many thanks also go to Sultan Azlan Shah Foundation and Malaysian Airline for the generous contribution to this lecture. I would like to express my appreciation to Yang Berbahagia, Tan Sri Dr. Visu Sunada Durai. <laughs> to the Protocol and Ceremony Division of Perak Darul Rizwan, to the deans of the Faculty of Law and all staff who contributed to the success of this public lecture. Ampun Tuanku, Patik sekali lagi menjunjung kasih. Di atas perkenan duli-duli tuanku Berangkat dan menyerikan seri, seri kuliah Undang-Undang Sultan Azlan Shah ini Sekian, terima kasih Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Your Royal Highnesses, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen With the stimulating lecture delivered by the Right Honourable Lord Carnworth We come to the successful conclusion of the 28th Sultan Azlan Shah Law Lecture. Your Royal Highness Sultan Nazrin Shah, Your Royal Highness Twanku Zara, Lord and Lady Carnworth, Your Highnesses, My Lords, Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, may I humble